when I started uh, school at Arkansas Tech, and just like most land-grant colleges around the, the country, during that period, first two years, uh, ROTC was uh, automatic. You had to go to uh, participate in Reserve Officer Training Corps. Um, uh, at first, I was not too enthused. Now, I've got to tell you, as a, as a young child growing up, I always wanted to be a soldier. Uh, when my friends were wanting to play Cowboys and Indians, we'd do that, and then we'd take turns so I could play soldier with them. Um, now, the re and I think a big impact on me when I was growing up, every adult male that I came in contact with were veterans of World War II. My father, my uncles, my neighbors, the men at church, all of them were veterans of World War II. Now, interestingly, uh, they didn't talk about it. They didn't tell you a whole lot about it. Part of, uh, probably the thing that influenced me most about uh, soldiering were at the movies. You see John Wayne that played every soldier, sailor, airman, marine that uh, ever existed. Uh, James Garner who played uh, William Darby and Darby's Rangers. Those folks had a great impact on me as I was growing up as well as my father as far as wanting to be a soldier. So but when I started school at Arkansas Tech, my first semester in ROTC uh, was not real thrilling. Uh, and, and I think part of that probably has to do with the fact that as a, as a basic soldier, listening to orders wasn't, wasn't really uh, inspirational. When I got promoted to a squad leader, all of a sudden things changed. Okay? And, and that began, I guess, my leadership training. And uh, I became more enthused as time went on. I've got a great uh, affinity for non-commissioned officers. One, because of my father, uh, who, uh, like I said, was an inspiration for me. But uh, uh, as a battery executive officer, <clears throat> our battery was selected to go uh, participate in a uh, NATO joint training exercise in Turkey in September of 1973. Okay. So our battery plus an infantry battalion from the 82nd Airborne Division went to Turkey and participated in a joint airborne operation field training exercise in Turkey. Um, uh, that was a good experience. It gave me an opportunity to uh, work and lead troops in a Middle East desert environment that I didn't really appreciate at the time, but it came in handy later on in my career. And my father had a great influence on me. He kept trying to talk me into joining the National Guard. Um, the, to let you know how little I knew about uh, the Guard, he was a battalion command sergeant major for the 217th Maintenance Battalion in Russellville, our hometown. I didn't want to be in the maintenance unit. I did not want to be in the same unit with my father that's command sergeant major. And he, uh, he told me, he said, hey, there's other units in the state. So uh, he, he, he said, he, matter of fact, he said, we've got field artillery units in the Arkansas Guard. Uh, it, the shocking thing for me, I grew up in the Guard. I grew up with my dad in the Guard. I'd never been exposed to field artillery throughout all that, that time. And so uh, when I found out about that, and certainly an opportunity to work full time, I decided this needs to be my career, not something else. Because one, I'd already invested four years of my life in field artillery organizations, and uh, so that's how that happened. Early in my career, I thought uh, Camp Robinson was the center of the universe for the National Guard. This was the state headquarters. I had actually applied while I was at Harrison early in my career for several positions that had opened up here and never was selected. And I was disillusioned because I thought, here I am, a blessing to the guard, and they have not selected me to come to the state headquarters. It wasn't until 11 years later I had the opportunity to come here, and I've got to thank those officers early in my career that allowed me to continue developing as a leader out in the field before coming here. One thing that came up in August of 1990, um, uh, Iraq invasion invaded Kuwait. Okay? Immediately, there were rumors that the 142nd Field Artillery was going to get mobilized, go over there. Um, in September, uh, rumors were getting 
stronger. Then they went away. Uh, November, I, and I'm working full time as a uh, state training officer plus commanding the 5th of the 206. Uh, I got a call from the chief of staff and said, uh, the brigade commander of the 142nd has requested you to command the second of the 142nd. And I said, uh, sir, I'm commanding the 5th of the 206. My allegiance right now is to the 39th Infantry Brigade, the battalion I'm commanding. I said, why, why has this come up? And he said, well, they've had some leadership changes. The battalion commander there just had back surgery. He's not going to be able to deploy. They need a leader, and the brigade commander has requested you. Uh, we had found out that morning at the state headquarters. It had not been made published, public at that point that the 142nd was going to be mobilized. Um, and so I reluctantly said, I'll do it. Um, at this point, and it is late in the day, I thought, you know, I probably need to go home and tell my family. Um, on my way home, the adjutant general had a news conference where he announced that the 142nd Field Artillery had, <laughs> had been mobilized and named the commanders. My wife heard on TV I was commanding the 2nd of 142nd. <laughs> Tough. Very tough. Okay. Now, uh, one thing I've got to say, when I got home, she said, you won't believe the crazy thing I heard on TV. They, you know, typical Army operation, they've screwed this up. And so I explained to her, she was a strong supporter, never hesitated, never flinched, never questioned my decision, supported me throughout that deployment. Uh, and always, as she always has, there were scud attacks, okay? Every single night. And so between nine, 10 o'clock at night, it's, that's when they occurred. Fortunately for us, just outside of Cobar Towers was a, uh, a U.S. Army Patriot uh, uh, battalion. And so you'd hear the scuds, you'd see the scuds coming in, and then Patriots would knock them out of the sky. Scary because you don't know when they're going to miss. You don't know when something's going to happen. My concern was for the 450 men that I had with me, we couldn't defend ourselves there. I mean, nice living conditions considering, but you could, we couldn't do anything about uh, scuds. Uh, the brigade uh, had decided, and, and we had just, I would say a third of our equipment that arrived at the port at that time. Brigade commanders uh, decided we need to move to the desert, to our tactical assembly area. Uh, and uh, I was thinking anything to get away from scuds. Within Cobar Towers, every night at nine o'clock, it was lights out because of scud attacks, uh, uh, which is good. For some reason, a brigade would always have a battalion commander and staff meeting at nine o'clock at night when it's pitch black dark, okay? And uh, uh, so have our meeting, then I've got to go back to our battalion headquarters, we're clear across the compound, and about halfway there, Scud is launched. And I'm out in the middle of this open area, and my first reaction is, I've got to get my mop suit out get this chemical protective suit on, put this mask on, which takes a few minutes, and I'm out in the middle of the open where, or do I run back to my battalion headquarters and get inside, then put my mop suit on? I took off running as hard as I've ever run, busting through the door, and there's my entire staff looking at me, and they're in their mop gear, laughing because I'm not in my mop gear. You know, and I've been a stickler. Whenever you hear the alarm or you see a scud, get in your gear. I think where the 142nd Field Artillery, the brigade, uh, gained some, what I would say, some notoriety is we went to the field, we supported 7th Corps Artillery uh, with support operations while we waited for our howitzers. Um, the, finally, the ships came in. We got our howitzers in. Uh, on 
the 22nd of February, actually the 21st of February, okay, 24 hours later, our battalion, the brigade, participated in artillery raids, combat operations, within 24 hours. Years later, I ran into some uh, active duty uh, regular army officers that were part of 7th Corps artillery, and they said, I was in the Corps artillery talk and we could not believe it. For two days, uh, we had specific missions where our artillery unit, our battalion, moved in front of the friendly forces, the infantry units, the army units, as far as we could safely fire artillery missions at uh, known enemy targets and then move back before they could do counterfire on us. Pretty, uh, pretty intense because they, you never knew when there might be incoming, when their radars might detect what we were doing. So we fired two days of artillery missions. On the 24th, that kicked off the ground war. We moved forward, uh, provided uh, supporting fires for the 1st Infantry Division uh, during uh, the attack, uh, went through the breach, the breach, the mines, minefields that were there, and uh, uh, spent a, a, a day or so doing that, shooting fire missions, um, and then uh, we were diverted to support the 1st uh, Armored Division of the United Kingdom uh, and moved into Kuwait with them. We supported them for the attack into Kuwait. So uh, by, by that point, the 28th of February, they called a ceasefire and uh, uh, we stayed uh, in Kuwait and Iraq uh, until about uh, the first part of May uh, before we were able to redeploy back. The adjutant general allowed me to do uh, about a five-month tour uh, at uh, Army Forces Command where they were looking for a director of mobilization forces um, uh, helping mobilize guard and reserve units for an upcoming conflict in the Middle East which turned out to be Operation Iraqi Freedom. So in about the five months that I worked temporary duty at, at Forcecom, uh, working with National Guard Bureau, working with the Headquarters Army staff and the Forcecom staff, we mobilized over 100,000 Army National Guard and Army Reserve units that deployed for Operation uh, uh, Iraqi Freedom. I was there on day one when the ground war started in uh, OIF. Um, uh, later on, uh, I had the opportunity to actually uh, uh, work in the Army Operations Center in the Pentagon. Uh, I did a tour there. It was a temporary tour because the uh, National Guard general officer that was working there uh, was temporarily reassigned to work for the uh, uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Reserve Affairs. They needed a Guard general officer to come in here for a short period. I, spended, I spent six months there in the Op Army Operations Center and 24-hour uh, operation, okay? Long days, long hours, uh, hectic uh, uh, pace. Uh, our job was to monitor the operations in Iraq and Afghanistan around the Army at the readiness training centers, ensuring that troops were being deployed when and where they were supposed to. Again, this was part of our, the mobilization of reserve components was part of our job to monitor and work that to support those in the, the state. I had the uh, opportunity to monitor what was going on in the 39th Infantry Brigade while they were deployed to Iraq, uh, uh, I, I was there during the, about the first six months of their deployment uh, in country. And so we got to keep up with those uh, significant actions that were taking place on the ground uh, while they were there. Challenging times for me were when we would lose a soldier in combat and uh, I have to present a flag to the family. Those are challenging. Those are emotional. Um, unfortunately, I had that privilege of doing that a number of times while I was the agent in general. Um, um, er, and every experience is a little bit different. Every family dynamic is a, a little bit uh, uh, different. And so, um, again, with the leadership that we had the support of a strong command sergeant major, um, 
we were able to provide um, appropriate military honors for every soldier that deserved that. I have been fortunate uh, to have been able to serve in the military and especially to serve as long as I did. Uh, 43 years is not necessarily typical. Uh, there are some that uh, serve pretty close to this, but uh, maybe not quite this, this long. Timing worked out. Some of it was timing. Some of it was just sheer luck uh, on my part. But I had an opportunity to do those personal goals or challenges that I, I developed as a child, okay? To be a paratrooper, to be an army ranger, to be a leader in an organization uh, in combat. So I was extremely fortunate uh, to do that. Uh, been blessed, as a, as a matter of fact. I would encourage any young man or woman, okay, if you don't know what you want to do with your life, consider the military. And I use the term soldier because that was my goal. But when you hear me say soldier, think of that as airman, sailor, marine, all of those I roll up into the term soldier when I say, hey, if you want to be a part of an organization, be, do something bigger than yourself, be a soldier. If you want to be a part of an organization, a winning organization, committed to serving this country, to doing what's right, be a soldier. Okay? Okay? If you want to be the best that you can be, okay? expand on some of the strengths that you may have right now and be a soldier.